having me, first of all. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am Sam, and I'm the Communications Director at AEJMC, um, like Jeremy said. And um, my background is in public relations, um, but um, I also run all of the organization's social media accounts. Um, so it's kind of a mesh of things. Um, I do all of the organization's communications, um, public relations, and all of the social media management. Um, so even though my background is in public relations, um, I have a lot of years um, running running social media and managing accounts and things like that. Um, not to date myself too much, but that wasn't around when I was in college. So I didn't take any actual classes on it. So that's another reason why I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I kind of just use my communications and public relations background and I started some accounts for the first nonprofit that I worked for and kind of just learned from the ground up um, as far as social media management. Um, but I've been with AEJMC since uh, 2013, I believe, um, so for a long time. But all of my experiences in the nonprofit sector. Um, so that's just kind of a real quick about me and kind of who I am and what I do. Um, but thank you guys for having me here today. Samantha, talk a little bit about the nonprofit sector, because I think that is a unique space to do uh, public relations and social media management. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, I actually minored in social work, so that's kind of how I fell into the nonprofit sector, just because PR and social work um, kind of went together in that way. Um, so I started at a very small nonprofit, like a South Carolina-based nonprofit that actually um, helped children with cancer in the state of South Carolina. So even though I was there for public relations, um, I did a variety of things from public relations to event planning to actually like programs, helping the families. And then that's the organization that I started all of their um, social media accounts for like from birth. Um, and manage those. Um, and then I transitioned over to AEJMC, who is also is a nonprofit, but a very different nonprofit. So this is like an international organization. Um, it's membership based. So the communications for AEJMC are on a much larger scale, um, just from emails to social media accounts to everything. Um, so non nonprofits um, are a little bit different in that a lot of them, no matter if they're big or small, don't have huge budgets for public relations, social media, advertising, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so most of what we do is, is organic. Most of what we do in the social media realm and the PR and the advertising is, is all organic. So it's, it's us doing it. Um, some nonprofits are able to, to spend some money on it and we do spend some money on it here and there, um, but, but for the most part, it is organic. So that kind of, that, that's a lot different than doing PR, social media or communications for um, basically for anywhere else. So AEJMC, ASJMC, these are journalism and mass communication professors from around the world. And as you said, it's a, it's a unique kind of organization. When you first started, uh, what was the learning curve like? Oh my gosh, um, big. <laughs> um, it probably took me a full year to fully grasp AEJMC, ASJMC, who we are, what we do just from an organizational standpoint. And then once I kind of had that down, it really helped me figure out, okay, how do I need to run these accounts? What are we using these accounts for? Um, best practices, things like that, because it was so different from the nonprofit that I came from. Um, it, it, was, it was probably a good year of just that learning curve and, and figuring it all out. As you mentioned, social media were not really around when you first started on the job. Could you take us back to when you were a student and kind of what you were thinking about uh, and how, how you ended up in this area of communication management uh, and then how you worked your way into social media management? Yeah, yeah. So when, when I was a student my last year, um, I did an internship, um, an internship for credit. 
Um, it, it wasn't paid. Um, and I actually interned at the first place that I ended up working um, called Children's Chance. So I was doing basically a public relations internship. Um, they kind of gave me, hey, help us promote this event. Hey, do advertising for this program that we're doing. Um, it, it really got my feet wet and it was a really good way um, for me to see all of the different areas of both nonprofits and PR and communications and nonprofits. Um, so I really started out doing more media relations um, because social media wasn't even a thing yet. Um, I started out doing a lot of media relations, um, reaching out to reporters, um, sending press releases out about events we had. That was kind of where it all started. And then um, I think the first account that we started was Facebook. Um, and it wasn't much long after, after Facebook launched and expanded beyond college campuses, because at first it was only for college campuses. You had to have a, um, a college campus email address to have an account. Um, so we started that kind of as an extension of the media relations as a way to promote our organization to people in our area and the general public for free. Um, so that kind of was our focus when we started social media accounts. Um, they were free and they were a promotion tool. And we started with face. I started with Facebook there and Twitter there um, because I was there long enough to Twitter came around. Um, so I guess just starting those and managing those and figuring out how to use those to promote, um, you know, who we were and what we were doing kind of transitioned me into having that experience. Um, and I kind of run social media accounts just as an extension of the organization, the website, um, and really a public relations tool and a promotion tool. Um, so even though I didn't have technically, you know, experience from school doing it, um, I created them from the ground up and ran them and kind of figured it all out. So when I came to AEJMC, much larger organization, um, and I came there as a, as a public, public relations person. Now I'm the communications director just because the organization is so big and there's so many moving parts to it. Um, it kind of just was a fit for, for me to run all of those accounts um, just because we're a small staff. So I think right now we're down to five people. So I'm managing the accounts, I'm running the accounts, all everything that goes into the accounts, um, I'm the one doing, which is helpful because I'm also doing all the organization communications and all of that ties together. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily say this is a one person job though. Um, so it can be a bit of a balancing act um, because social media in itself, um, just running social media accounts for a nonprofit, a corporation, a side business, whatever, can and is a full-time job. Um, so it's a That's little a bit of a balancing point. act running the accounts um, for, a, for a larger organization like we are. Yeah, I think it's a huge point because we've been working the last half dozen years with rural Nebraska communities, uh, leveraging social media to do exactly what you were talking about in the beginning, you know, just getting organic reach, trying mm -hmm. to get messages out into communities. And, and like you, um, they're, they're, you know, these are nonprofit folks who have, you know, seven other hats to wear and social media is one of those jobs. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about the shift from pure organic reach in the beginning and kind of that discussion that we used to have about in the old days about buzz on social media to a more strategic approach? you know, the strategies and tactics, and I think you said it well, building around your organizational goals and values. Yeah, um, because a lot of times the people that are doing this, their time is limited, their resources are limited, they're probably, like you said, wearing multiple hats, you do really want to use it in the most strategic way um, to get the most out of it and take advantage of it. Because I really could spend all day, every day of my work day only running and managing these social media accounts, but that's not that's not reality. There's a lot of other things to do. Um, so basically what I try to do is um, 
just kind of build off the organization as a whole. Um, and I use our website um, as pretty much my main tool um, for social media. So you always want to make sure that hopefully if, if you can, that you're, you, whoever you're working for with has a great website and then you try to use social media as an extension of that to really get those items out there. So I leave, basically leave our website up on my computer or whatever I'm working on the entire day and pull from that. Um, ideally, and I do this for our conference, we do a big conference every year, I will um, develop a social media calendar down to the day and the time of the post just to help guide me because it's so much. Um, and I really, I used to do that for the year and then COVID hit and everything just completely changed. And I completely shifted from scheduling everything out to not scheduling everything out for a variety of reasons. Um, but I hope to get back to that because when you can kind of look at what you're doing and when and map it all out in a strategic way, um, and if you run a Twitter account and a Facebook account and an Instagram account, you kind of have an idea of what you're going to post when, when you might do reminders about it. And normally those type of things go along with what's on your website, go along with what maybe we're emailing out to members. So it kind of all ties together in more of a plan in the sense of, of, a, of a big picture plan. Sam, are there tools that uh, you've come to rely upon in terms of executing the plan? Um, yes. Um, back when I did do a lot of pre-scheduling, um, I used Buffer, the Buffer app, um, and you can schedule posts across multiple accounts. Um, and there's a free version and a paid version. Um, so, so that was really nice. Um, we use an email system called Constant Contact. Um, so that helps with creating and scheduling and you can pre-schedule emails um, and things like that. I'm kind of old school in the sense that I also like to just post when I'm going to post. Um, so, and, and so now I don't pre-schedule everything out, but there are great tools out there, both free and paid, like Buffer, um, Sprout Social, things like that, that, that are really helpful. Now, you mentioned the annual conference in August, and it seems as though there is a spike of activity, particularly live tweeting on Twitter during the conference, which goes on the better part of a week. How do you manage that? And then to what extent, you know, are you using Twitter analytics or other data tools to get a handle on what's going on? That's a great question. Yes. Um, so the week of our annual co conference and leading up to it, and even sometimes a few days after it, is, is definitely our most active time on Twitter in particular. Um, and we love that you guys, that your lab tracks a lot of that for us. Um, it's awesome. And we, we used it in our communications after the conference um, with your permission. So that's fantastic. But yeah, so I'm I'm the only one monitoring that. Um, so I have an iPad there. I monitor our at AEJMC, our account. Um, I monitor our conference hashtag. Um, I try to monitor, sometimes people will use variations of our hashtag. I try to monitor those as much as I can. Um, and it's really just, that's kind of a manual process for me because it's, happening so fast and it's all day um, and I'm the one on there responding and retweeting and posting and and monitoring all of that. Um, I don't use Twitter analytics as much as I would like to um, just simply for time purposes. Um, unfortunately kind of the the statistics and the analytical part kind of falls to the end um, just because there's so much to do, but um, we do try to we do try to keep a handle on it and look at it. And then, like I said, the fact that you guys social media lab follows um, keeps up with all of that. We it's a great resource for us. Um, but yeah, that's that. definitely our most active time. And Twitter is the main mode of social media that we use um, with that big event. 
And you have introduced outside of the conference uh, in August, you've introduced some Twitter live chats over the past couple of years. How's that going? Yes, we have. Um, those have been great for us. And that is one of my favorite, that has become one of my favorite things to do is, um, is to administer live, live chats on Twitter. It works really well for us. Um, I've heard kind of some some crazy stories about other places doing them and sometimes them not working but for us it does because our audience is so specific um and so we're not getting like the hashtag isn't getting taken and used for something else and things like that but um yeah we've we've kind of throughout the year i think we've done maybe like three or four throughout the year for the past few years and we've tried to pick a topic that's like really relevant and timely to our members um, so one time we did one around our paper call, um, our paper competition for our conference. Um, we've done a lot of grad student things on there. And basically what we'll do is we'll pick the topic. Uh, we have a specific hashtag that we use. We get a few kind of expert um, members to, to speak about the topic. So it's normally our main account and then maybe two to four people that are our guests. Um, and it's, it's really easy to run and we kind of will get together and pre-select all of our questions so they know because it's so fast paced. Um, so I'll kind of be running it from our account and I'll say, um, like, I'll welcome everybody, use the hashtag, tag our speakers, and then I'll just start with the questions. I'll post the questions, they'll answer, I'll share it. And we normally do like eight to 10 questions. Um, and people um, participate through the hashtag. They can ask their own questions um, and we'll run them for like an hour and they work really well. They're really easy to do. Um, they're free. So that's been really great for us. So I think we'll probably continue that and maybe even do, do more of it. Fantastic. Let's open it up to students uh, and any student questions out there, I'm sure that uh, some of you have some good questions to ask a professional in this in this area of communications and social media. What's on your minds? I have a question. So uh, you mentioned uh, there's those apps you can use that, that schedule your posts and things like that. Um, have you noticed if there's any difference in interaction between scheduling a post other or just posting it whenever? That is a great question. Um, I have not noticed any difference between scheduling it and just posting it. Um, sometimes the times can make a difference. Um, and sometimes some of these apps will give you data on that. Um, and, and you can always look up data on it too. Um, on, you know, like, if you post it this day at this time, it's going to get more interaction and more reach. Um, I look at that, but I don't follow those to the T because I've been running these accounts for so long um, that sometimes you can kind of tell when your own members are most active and most responsive and when you get more engagement, if that makes sense. Um, because the statistics and the data that they're giving you are for the platforms themselves and not necessarily for your people and your followers. Um, but that's a great question. And I wish I paid a little bit more attention to that than I do. Um, but for us, I haven't really noticed any difference. I agree. I think in the beginning, day and time was huge because everything was in real time with you know, as the platforms grew and there were more people online and you have algorithms and mm -hmm. all of that and, you know, kind of filtering for favorites and all of that sort of thing, it might be a little less important, but you bring up a great point, Sam, which is, you know, what I like to talk about in terms of real time social media listening and engagement. And, you know, it takes some time to listen and not just make posts and leave. I think that's the biggest mistake people can make yes. is to not yeah. come back and see what's happening, right? Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think I've used the word like post and ghost before. Like I've literally explained that to someone um, that that is one of 
the not great things you should do, um, especially if you're posting something that you're not sure how maybe your followers or your members or whoever, you're not sure how they're going to react to. And a lot of times you'll know, you'll, you'll have a feeling if it could go one way or the other, but sometimes you don't. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's why I really like the organic engagement being on there. Um, because like if you're on our AEJMC account and you're getting a reply, it's it's a, it's a human. It's me. Um, so yeah, that's I, I totally agree with that. All right, Zach had a good question. Let's take another one. I have one. Um, I feel like a lot. Of, I feel like a lot of people. There's a stigma behind whether or not you should post every day, whether you should post three times a day. And I definitely think it depends, like from client to client. But I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I see a lot of these like tutorial tutorials and videos that are like, if you want the most success, do X X X, and it's not really that. It's more of knowing who you're working for and who your followers are. Um, and that just comes with time. I don't think there's any magic number of posts this many times a day, this many times a week, um, and never post just to post something. That would probably be one of the biggest things I would say. Um, if you don't have much going on right now and there's nothing to post, I mean, don't just make something up to post it. Um, but yeah, and, and it also varies for, for platform. Like on Twitter, for the most part, we are posting multiple times a day, Monday through Friday. Um, there will be some times where we'll post on the night and, nights and weekend, especially during conference or if we have something big going on. But for the most part for us, um, it's that weekday just because we're in office and it's only one person doing it. Um, but if you're working for maybe like you know, a, a company that's more active on the weekend, you'd be posting more on the weekend. So it's really not as much about a specific number of posts per day. It's more of just kind of knowing your audience and knowing who these are for um, and, and doing it accordingly, if, if that makes sense. When you were using a social media calendar, you mentioned maybe getting back to that. But did you ever do those tie-ins to like, you know, a national day or some other calendar event that was going on? And, and if so, was that successful for you? We don't do much of that um, for several reasons. Um, most aren't applicable to us. Um, I do like the idea of the ones that, you know, the few that would make sense tying into that and I and I know that we've done it before it's been a while um but like I'll see some accounts that just they're gonna make a post about a national day no matter what no matter if it has something to do with them or not um I'm not really the biggest fan of that but I do like it if it makes sense and ties into what you're doing Great, let's take another question. Hi, I have a question. Um, do you see a difference in the engagement that on the different platforms and do you kind of specify the posts for particular platforms that don't have as much engagement or have more engagement? Yes, that yes. is a great question. Um, such a great question. Yes, I do definitely see a difference in the engagement across platforms. So our main social media platforms are Twitter. Um, it's definitely our biggest one. Facebook, um, we do have an Instagram. And I recently started a TikTok just because I wanted to for fun. Um, we don't have a lot of time to de dedicate to it. But um, so, yeah, I do. And I do try to tailor the post per platform. I'm also not a fan of doing one 
one post, the exact same post and putting it on all of your platforms um, at the same time. Um, not that that's wrong. I just like to tailor it and make it a little more specific. So Twitter is probably where we get the most interaction. Um, a lot of engagement, a lot of back and forth. We'll get DMs, all of that stuff. Um, Facebook, just because of the way it's set up, because we're a page, um, in my opinion, just isn't as user friendly for interaction for us. Um, so it's more informational. Um, it, it's really more informational. There's not as much of engagement. I don't have the time or the tools to track it enough, I guess, for and be able to respond to any time anybody mentions AEJMC and things like that. So Facebook's more informational. Um, obviously, if somebody tags us or asks a question, we, we do try to respond. Um, Instagram, we are really still growing. Um, and I see a lot of engagement and activity on stories, um, like at the conference. Um, we, we just don't have as much content to post there. Um, so that for us is a work in progress. Um, but I definitely do like tailoring the post for the platform. And, and I definitely see a difference uh, across platforms and engagement. Excuse me, Mr. Officer. No, touch them up and go. This is our silly TikTok. But, but it, and it's crazy because if I did have the time to pour into TikTok, I totally would just because um, the reach is just, I've never seen anything like it. Um, so it, that's just more for fun behind the scenes. We'll jump on a trend if we have time every now and then and, and post something. Um, but, but Twitter is definitely by far our main, our main social media. Well, and it's interesting, Sam, because you mentioned earlier clients and the students are gonna be working in Maverick social media with some clients. But in your case, the clients are, are, are largely professors and graduate students, and I suppose also sponsors, advertisers, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, that's definitely a difference in the nonprofit world. Um, because if you guys are working, you know, for a business or a corporation or a PR firm or an ad agency or, or whatever, um, it's a little different. Our, our audience is mostly our members, uh, which is pretty specific. Um, I mean, it's a little broader for our, broader than our members, but our main audience is our members who are journalism professors, journalism educators, deans, directors of schools, things like that. Um, so we do, for the most part, really try to tailor our posts and our content, you know, to our audience. Um, so we'll post about our own things that we have going on, but then we'll also post about other organizations and things that they have going on. We'll share that information too, if we think that it's of, of interest to our to our members who basically is our is our audience. I think we have time for one more student question. If somebody has one they'd like to, to ask Sam. I have another one if nobody else does. Um, is it like, what have, have you noticed is the most like efficient way to get growth like I know it's sometimes just about like um I don't know like is it mostly like organic or do you have people like um coming from like your website to follow you on there or is it just like somehow getting in an algorithm to recommend to people or what do you think it is mostly that helps you grow that's a good question. And my answer is probably going to be different than somebody that runs social media for like a business or a corporation. Um, for us, it probably is, it is organic um, and it's just time and engagement and the effort, you know, that we're putting into it. Um, when I got these accounts, um, they were more run basically only information only just they would maybe post which isn't wrong um you know 
post a call we had once a week or there might be two posts a week on Twitter or something like that. Um, nothing wrong with that at all, but I kind of took that and added the engagement aspect of it. So I'll reply to people, I'll tag people. Um, we, we still do all the informational stuff, but we really, I really try to focus on that engagement part um, because part of social media is customer service. So I'm going to try to respond to you. I'm going to try to help you. Um, I might joke back and forth with you every now and then, that kind of thing. So because we are a nonprofit and we don't have the dollars for, um, you know, for targeted ads and things like that, ours is mostly organic. And then um, it definitely does tie into our website. We, we do get traffic from our website, um, which also helps. Um, now, if it was a business or a corporation, um, I'm sure it's probably a mix of advertising and what they're able to do ad wise on social media, because that definitely is it definitely works. Um, and then a mix of organic too. Uh, organic social is just it's harder. It takes a lot of time. Um, it's kind of a marathon, not a sprint. Cool. Thank you. Excellent, Sam. I just have a couple of things to uh, wrap up here, a couple of questions you might be able to help us with. So our faculty right now uh, are thinking, members are thinking about changes they want to do to update the JMC curriculum over the next, say, three to five years. And you mentioned kind of the explosive growth of TikTok. Is there any advice you would give based on your professional experience in terms of the courses, the skill sets that students should absolutely have uh, before they leave the university to be prepared? That is such a such a great question. Um, and I don't know, I wish I knew more what courses are already being offered. Um, and I just don't. But yeah, I mean, I would say um, Obviously, you know, you need the communication skills, but I think something that would be really beneficial is kind of like what we're doing here, um, get people from outside of the academy of the university um, that actually run accounts um, and partner with them maybe for some of these classes um, or for internships. Like I, I started doing an internship um, but just writing skills, editing skills, um, communication skills. Um, I mean, for me, I use a lot of my public relations background for social media because social media is not cut and dry at all. A lot of it's judgment calls. Um, and I know in bigger companies and corporations, there's a lot of layers. Um, so some people are running accounts that you have to get post approved by the company lawyer. That's not AEJMC at all. It's almost the opposite. Um, pretty much it's going to be me making the judgment call on a post or not. Every now and then I do have to go above myself to our director or even sometimes our board of directors. But for the most part, um, it, it, it comes down to me. So having that PR background really helps um, with that. But yeah, I mean, just those nitty gritty skills of just how to run these accounts um, is the main thing. And, and, and I will say kind of finding a group of people that maybe um, can mentor you, that maybe have done it, um, that's been really helpful. I have a few people um, that I'll kind of ask, you know, I'll just throw something off of or ask or, and that's really helpful because I don't have the school background for social media per se, but all of these other things tie into it. So um, I think the best thing that they could do is ask professionals while when they're trying to figure out the courses and the curriculum is ask people in the field that are doing it, um, you know, what they want to see and what they need. I loved your comment about judgment calls because one of the conversations that we're going to be having starting next week is about emphasizing professional ethics in, in the curriculum. And that leads me to my final question, which is what career advice would you give students? These are mostly juniors, seniors. Some of them, I think, will be graduating December and, and May of this year. Uh, what, 
what, what's the most important thing you can tell them as they go out into the working world? Um, oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. Just, just trust yourself. Um, and like I said, if you can kind of find a community or a mentor, even if it's one person, if it's 20 people, I've actually used Twitter a lot for this. Um, there's a hashtag on Twitter. I think it's hashtag marketing Twitter, but it encompasses PR, social media, um, everything. Um, and I've ended up connecting with other people in my field and I'll shoot them a DM and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? Um, for me, that's been really helpful is to kind of build your community kind of in the field that you want to go into. And that takes time. Um, but, but it's super helpful. It's super helpful. Um, don't ever be afraid to reach out to anybody, ask a question. I'll put my email in the chat cause I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, but just, just kind of trust yourself. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions um, and, and maybe find some people that are kind of in the field of, of what you're doing um, to, to bounce ideas off or um, vent to or network with or whatever it may be. Great advice, Samantha. Thank you so much for taking this a uh, little bit more than half hour to meet with us in your busy day. I wasn't able to make it to Detroit in August, but I'm hopeful that I will make it to Washington, D.C. next August yes. and see you there. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And yeah, y'all grab my email um, or we're at AJMC on Twitter. You can find me that way. Um, I'm around. But yeah, if you ever have any questions or anything, I'm, I'm happy to, to try to help.